Hi, welcome back to another episode of Sacred Wild Man. My name is Roy, and today's topic is going to be about the dragon, or dragons, serpents. And this was inspired by two videos that I came across recently on YouTube, which I will put in the link in the description. And I will also include a link to um, one other video. So a total of three, and the third one is gonna be about Bruce Lee and the film Enter the Dragon. So theme on dragons. And what was notable about these two other videos, so the first was the Red Book, a presentation given by Becca Tarnas, where she compares the Red Book of Carl Jung, which is literally titled The Red Book, and then also J.R.R. Tolkien's Red Book, which I don't know if it was titled Red Book, but it is Red. And I started to search Carl Jung's Red Book just online because I came across it in this book in case of spiritual emergency, just trying to make more sense of what I went through recently in the last year. And it was really powerful to read about Carl Jung's own process from 1913 to 1916. His own psychotic episode is perhaps the most common term we know of these experiences of breaking away from reality. Uh, but I prefer the term spiritual emergency or spiritual crisis because there is an opportunity there. It's not just you're going crazy and well, good luck. You know, we'll put you in a mental institute and hope you do well. You know, so reading through this book in case of spiritual emergency and reading some of the quotes that uh, Catherine Lucas took out from the Red Book, it was just really powerful and inspiring to hear how Carl Jung worked around this. And he was also known for his saying about, you know, in order to reach into the heavens, for the tree branches to reach into the heavens, you must first have your roots reach down deep into the depths of hell. And so there's this, there's this trial, tribulation, and initiation, this hero's journey that we go through. And oftentimes, these initiations, hero's journeys, are rife with the symbology of the dragon. Right? You can think about um, the dragon or serpent. They can be synonymous according to some sources I looked at online. Some that I've written down here are Medusa, right? the serpent heads. And if you stare at this horrible, horrible, horrifying uh, sight of Medusa, you would be petrified in fear and shock and turn into stone. There's also the basilisk from Harry Potter. Again, a giant serpent. You stare at it, it petrifies you, you turn into stone. And then of course there is smog, desolation of smog, this big fearsome dragon that is guarding the treasure in Tolkien's book, The Hobbit. And a big shift that happened for me was in the second video, which was a podcast uh, interviewing Matthias De Stefano. And he talked about, he was looking into the etymology of the word dragon. And he said it's Greek roots, and maybe there's some other roots to this word mean to see clearly or to stare, to observe directly the one that stares at you or the sense of self-awareness and self-observation you're going within. So it's just this eye that you're looking into or you're being looked at from. And lo and behold, Tolkien's the Lord of the Rings, you have the eye of Sauron, right? That is gazing outwards. Now, why this really shifted my perspective and just had a deep impact on me is oftentimes, especially here in the West and with the Judeo-Christian influence, 
dragons and serpents are given a negative connotation. Right? You have the serpent in the Garden of Eden, which caused all the trouble, right? caused Adam and Eve to stumble, and the imagery of needing to have the serpent's head stomped or crushed or cut off. Uh, you also hear a lot about you know slaying the dragon. So there's a lot of hostility towards this dragon, towards the serpent. Not saying it's good or bad, right or wrong, just observing and noting that that is what is common here in the West. But this is quite different in cultures in the East or perhaps um, other indigenous cultures where this dragon and the serpent is not seen in that way, but it's actually seen as a representation of the primi primordial life force, uh, even the creation of life itself, this cosmic energy. And a book that goes into some of that is The Cosmic Serpent by Jeremy Narby. And I'll just read some quotes here that stood out to me. Narby writes, I plunged back into Harner's book, but found no further mention of DNA. However, a few pages on, Harner notes that dragon and serpent are synonymous. This made me think that the double helix of DNA resembled, in its form, two entwined serpents. According to Reichel Dolmatov, the drawing on page 58 shows that within the fissure, two intertwined snakes are lying, a giant anaconda and a rainbow boa, a large river snake of dark dull colors and an equally large land snake of spectacular bright colors. In Dasana shamanism, these two serpents symbolize a female and male principle, a mother and a father image, water and land. In brief, they represent a concept of binary opposition, which has to be overcome in order to achieve individual awareness and integration. The snakes are imagined as spiraling rhythmically in a swaying motion from one side to another. And finally, this time it was Australian Aborigines who considered that the creation of life was the work of a cosmic personage related to universal fecundity, the rainbow snake, whose powers were symbolized by quartz crystals. It so happens that the Dasana of the Colombian Amazon also associate the cosmic anaconda, creator of life, with a quartz crystal. How could it be that Australian Aborigines separated from the rest of humanity for 40,000 years tell the same story about the creation of life by a cosmic serpent associated with a quartz crystal as is told by ayahuasca drinking Amazonians? So this is all pretty powerful to me to consider you know, the, the structure of DNA, that, that symbol you see, uh, I think some medical symbol, right? You see on ambulances or hospitals, that central rod, which would in this case represent the spine, spinal cord, and then the two serpents intertwined wrapping around it. Along with this new awareness that I have of dragon meaning to stare or to see clearly or to observe directly. To me, I'm connecting a lot of this to inner work, the, the gaze inward. And often this process is not one that is just, you know, rainbows and unicorns to look within oneself. Oftentimes for people who first practice some form of meditation, of looking in, of paying attention to your thoughts, your feelings, your physical stimuli that you notice, it can be very difficult, uh, sometimes even scary, to deal with this mind storm, this mind chatter, the monkey mind, or to feel and notice all these things that previously you would have just distracted yourself from. Right, because your gaze is turned outwards as opposed to inward. And for me, this all is beginning to sync up around, well, sure, you can have this serpent or dragon symbology of something fearsome and terrifying, 
that could petrify you, right? This horrifying sight of the Medusa head or the basilisk or the dragon guarding the treasure. But they all represent what Joseph Campbell calls the threshold guardians, right? They're guarding this threshold between the, the you, the conditioned you as you know yourself, the ego, and what is beyond that. But in order to get there, you must give of something of yourself, namely your conditioned self, your ego. In Enter the Dragon with Bruce Lee, when he's talking to the teacher, and then later when he's in the final fight, right, his teacher says, the enemy only has images and illusions behind which he hides his true motives. Destroy the image and you will break the enemy. And to me, this ties in pretty well with what I talked about in a previous video um, titled, Are You Addicted to Suffering? Which is, uh, I went into the story with Buddha and Mara. Mara being this demon that is basically assaulting Buddha as he is trying to realize enlightenment. So he sends all these illusions, right, these images to incite fear, lust, whatever it is, anything to tempt, distract, um, take down Buddha. And Buddha simply just stares into it, right, the, the dragon uh, posture, if you will, meaning to see or observe directly. And he doesn't run or he doesn't attack and fight, but he's simply just present and fully there. And then later, you know, he touches the earth and the earth bears witness to him and Mara is gone. There's another story with Buddha where he was guarded and protected by the, I believe it's the Naga, named Mukalinda, which was this seven-headed snake that was protecting Buddha from the elements shortly after he realized enlightenment, which I find, again, very interesting, right? In, in some of the indigenous or Eastern traditions, the serpent or snake is not seen as this fearsome thing necessarily, um, but it can be fearsome, but also it seems very holy and cosmic, vast. And what stood out to me was the snake being seven-headed, which I thought, well, you know, you have the seven chakras in the um, system of Hinduism, and could that be a representation of the seven-headed snake being an activation of Buddha's uh, seven chakras, right? The, there's also the kundalini serpent, right? Coiled at the base of the spine that's supposed to rise upward. And as it does, it clears out any blockages in this energy centers. But that can also mean stirring up traumas and, you know, activating a lot of things, which is why when some people experience these spontaneous kundalini awakenings, it can be really difficult. So just some things, you know, I don't know if there's necessarily a correlation, but this is just where the connection started happening for me. And the other piece to capture this uh, element of the dragon, the serpent being the one who guards, the one who tests, um, but also the one who, if you are able to stare and observe at directly, mainly yourself, and pass that threshold as you give up your egoic mind, you reach something uh, know, more, more powerful or more, there's, there's an opportunity there. There's, there's the gift on the other side. Carl Jung's experience I think captures this aspect of the spiritual crisis really well. So this isn't from the actual Red Book, but it's from, again, in case of spiritual emergency, uh, of Catherine Lucas quoting, I believe, from the Red Book. So let me 
find it here. Okay. And throughout this process, Carl Jung, he, he created a lot of art. So if you choose to buy the red book, which is huge, or you just want to search the images up online, you can see his whole process. So there's a lot of active imagination going on for him in this process. So here is a piece where, as he's kind of traveling through this desert area in his experience and his imagination, he writes, my soul, what am I to do here? But my soul spoke to me and said, wait. I heard the cruel word, torment belongs to the desert. Nobody can spare themselves the waiting and most will be unable to bear this torment. Young knows only too well the torture of the agonizing wait, sitting with the unknown, facing the unknown, all the time with the fear that he is losing his mind. And yet, all he can do is sit with it, bear with it. The greater his ability to bear with it, the better he will fare. Likewise, all we can do is sit with it, bear with it. The greater our ability to bear with it, the better we will fare. And suddenly, to your shivering horror, it becomes clear to you that you have fallen into the boundless, the abyss, the inanity of eternal chaos. It rushes toward you as if carried by the roaring winds of a storm, the hurtling waves of the sea. Young has to deal with fear, fear of losing his mind, the fear of death, which spread like poison everywhere in my body, and just plain fear. You dread the depths. It should horrify you, since the way of what is to come leads through it. You must endure the temptation of fear and doubt, and at the same time acknowledge to the bone that your fear is justified and your doubt is reasonable. I've had to recognize that I must submit to what I fear. Yes, even more, that I must even love what horrifies me. What Jung is recognizing here is our need to step towards those aspects of our experience of the crisis that we instinctively want to push away. By resisting, we only exacerbate matters. Likewise, his soul openly encourages him to let madness in. My soul spoke to me in a whisper, urgently and alarmingly. You wanted to accept everything, so accept madness too. Let the light of your madness shine and it will suddenly dawn on you. Madness is not to be despised and not to be feared, but instead you should give it life. My soul spoke to me saying, my path is light, yet I indignantly answered, do you call light what we men call the worst darkness? Here in frustration, Jung sums up the paradox of spiritual emergency, that what appears to be our worst nightmare can, in fact, be our greatest blessing that there is light in the darkness. Young's tone is one of disbelief. It can be so very difficult to know this truth when we are in the thick of it all. Ultimately, Young surrenders to the process, which is all any of us can, and indeed must do. I lock the past with one key, with the other I open the future. This takes place through my transformation. The miracle of transformation commands, I am its servant. I love those quotes. They very much landed with me deeply because having gone through this experience myself most recently, and I would say times before, but again, this being the most recent experience, it's really fresh, is that the experience of a spiritual emergency, crisis, awakening, psychosis, along with this imagery with this hero's journey of facing the dragon, facing the serpent, this fearful, fearsome, terrifying thing, but also this cosmic life force, this creator of life, this primordial energy within you, not just without, but within you. It really captures the, um, I guess, that, that Chinese character, right, of believe it's Wei Ji, which is you have danger as one of the characters, right? 
but you also have within it the character of opportunity. So there's an opportunity and there's danger within this experience, within this thing. And yet they, they are intimately linked that yes, there is a danger to this. Of you looking inward, observing yourself, of facing your greatest fears, which often are not out there, but it's more within you. You face an existential crisis. You might face an ego death. And this isn't something that can be forced, really. It's, it's something that, you know, it might, it might just happen and you have your own choice. Uh, other times it might, as some people have spoken, supposedly, you know, we've, we've made all these agreements before we even incarnated here on earth, right? Of all the experiences that we would have, the lessons that we would learn. And so perhaps a part of us has already decided at some point along our path, we would have these experiences of an emergency of this crisis. And that would create an opening to something more. And in that presentation by Becca Tarnas about the Red Book of Jung and Tolkien, she brings up a really great point uh, when an audience member asks about the the Eye of Sauron, like, what do you think that represents? And she says, it is an eye that never looks inward. It is an eye that is always looking out. It drinks in by means of the eye, taking a part of the evil power back to itself. And when it is brought back to the heart of where it was made and unmade, it is completely destroyed. A ring is like a representation of an eye. By bringing the eye back in and turning it in on itself, evil is unmade. The relationship between the eye and evil is that it can't look at itself, and if it does, it is no more. And if you've seen the movie or you've read the book, yeah, you know, Frodo, Sam, Gollum, they're all wrestling around with the ring at Mount Doom. And they're trying to get it into the fire. And eventually it does. And as Becca said, the place from which it was created, it's being brought back, and that is its own undoing. So beyond that, there's not enough, words aren't enough to really capture the feeling of this, but there's something very poignant and powerful about that, that uh, per her words, evil can't look at itself, and if it does, it is no more. And thinking about, yes, the eye of Sauron, or even symbology around I, like the letter I, self, ego, or the I, you know, you have AI, artificial intelligence. Some also do a wordplay with that of the all seeing eye, like Sauron, or the iPhone. Right? You have all these things that are ultimately looking outward or distractions, right? With, with artificial intelligence, with an iPhone, there is no in my opinion, capacity for self-awareness, to look within oneself um, in a manner that feels, I don't know, organic. It's, it's kind of hard to put words to it. Something else that just popped up for me is I, robot, right? There's the letter I, um, and the, I forget the name of that computer program thing towards the end, if it was like Vicky or something, the name, uh, or she's saying, you know, my logic is undeniable and needing to eradicate humans or something like that. Uh, can't recall. Um, but it sees the issue as outside, right? There's a finger pointing out saying, you know, humans are the problem. You are the problem, or this is the problem. No one is looking inward to seeing how, how is what I see out there actually a reflection of what also exists within me. Rather than attempting to change the world and believing that will fix things, why don't I start with myself? And then by changing myself, I change the world. Right? Which I think throughout history when you have these people that 
you know, these holy people that so many people follow, you know, your Jesus, your Buddha, Muhammad, whoever it is, I think people felt that, right? You, you catch the vibe, you catch the frequency of there's something about this person and I need to be near them because there's something there. It's like, well, they don't have anything that you don't. Perhaps they've just realized it and all they're really doing is pointing it back to you so you can have that awakening within yourself. So to conclude, um, these dragons, the serpents, right? Uh, the etymology around the word being to see clearly or see directly, to observe, uh, gives us this opportunity to move beyond just the Western Judeo-Christian representation of serpents and dragons as something evil, something bad, but more so as we can begin to see them as these threshold guardians which is exactly why I chose the imagery of a snake for my banner for my website and also YouTube channel. Because it, it came from also a dream. You know, there was a dream where, I don't know, this maybe like back in 2017 or 2018 maybe, uh, where I was wrestling with snakes in my dreams of different colors. Um, just, it was an interesting piece of symbology. And I think there is this aspect of internal wrestling that we do and then you reach a point where you like Jung speaks to you have to surrender right? you have to surrender to the fear accept even love the fear and through doing so it becomes transformed but it isn't something you can know ahead of hand it is only a completely in the present moment realization as you're letting go letting go and letting go and we will be tested and i think even the times that we live in can in some ways you know represent the opportunity of the dragon of the serpent to see directly to look and observe within instead of outward because right now outward all there is is more fear porn all the different things you know endless that you should be afraid of mad about sad about all on a screen, right? A TV screen or your the screen of your phone, right? All these external distractions looking outward, never in. And so I think this is a time that we live in to really face the dragon, right? Enter the dragon. And then how you will emerge on the other side remains for you to see. And when we can go within, then we have a more, I think, stable place to go out, to go without. Just like the ocean tide, so it goes in, it goes out, it goes in and goes out. And that's it. So thanks for tuning in, listening to this uh, sort of presentation and realization that I had recently about the dragon. And if you have any comments, questions, I'd love to hear them. Just leave a comment below and I will see you in the next video.